Hello, friends. Welcome again to God's Word Alive. We've got another exciting Bible study tonight. I hope you have got your Bibles out, and uh, we're and uh, we're going to dig in pretty quick here because we've got a lot of studying to do tonight, Brian. Yeah. A couple of housekeeping things for you. If you're a veteran, you've heard it before. But if not, uh, we love interaction. And there are two ways you can interact. Number one, you can make comments at the bottom of the Facebook live feed. That's the first way. Second way is you can text in comments or information or prayer requests to 479-220-7107. I'll repeat that. 479 220 7107. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes, but tonight is a is a really important night for you to engage uh, heavily with our our uh, our topic. And we're going to explain just in a little bit how you can do that. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Etienne, will you lift up prayer for us? We need it tonight, don't we? Yes, sir, we do. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, it's our privilege again this evening to to be moderators in this study. Lord, we're just messengers. We're willing, we're willing to bring a message. The message is you. And so I pray, Lord, that as we open your word, that you will come through loud and clear. This is not something that we're making up. We are just relaying what you've asked us to relay to those who want to hear more. So I pray, Lord, that as those who have come to Facebook Live this evening to sit back and to hear words from your throne room, I pray, Lord, that their hearts have been already prepared to receive the message you want them to hear. Lord, we live here at the end of time, and you are calling us to make a full commitment to you. We don't have any time left, Lord, any more time left to play games. We have to get real. Because if we don't, we will fall for Satan's deceptions. So guide this study, Lord. Help the words that the three of us utter here tonight, not to be our own thoughts or our own ideas, but that you would clearly speak through us. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, guys, let's get into the Bible study. Good. This is going to be a good one. Uh, we, have, we have been covering God's final plea. That's right to humanity mm -hmm. right before Jesus Christ returns. That's why this is so incredibly important. You know, we got to get this right. And uh, tonight, we're going to get real. We're going to get real with this message. But before we get dive into this message, uh, we really will never understand God's final plea until you understand that there's a huge, big cosmic conflict between good and evil. And, it, and this, it's a war between good and evil, a battle. And, and the amazing thing is where this battle began at. According to the Bible, in revelation, worship that really belonged to God, that it belonged to Him. Uh, his weapon, what, what was His weapon, guys? Deception. 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 Yeah. I mean, it's His deceiving power. Now, you've got to remember that in, uh, He was able to deceive one-third of the angels into following him. Can you imagine? That's how deceiving him he is. We, we are no match for his deceiving power. He worship, He wanted the worship that only belonged to God. So the war broke out. Uh, the devil and his angels were kicked out of heaven, but they were kicked out to hear, <laughs> to hear. Yeah, 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 that's right. So, and then that was Revelation 12. Revelation 13, true to God's warning, Satan began a conspiracy to deceive. God's children into worshiping Him, just like just like God had warned us, and worshiping Him His way, and even on His day, and we, we see that picked up. So as we get into Revelation 14 in this final plea yep. uh, to all humanity, right before Jesus comes, God, like a loving parent, sends out a warning. So, well, and and if you had uh, seen our Facebook advertising for tonight. You're going to see that we called it uh, the Monday Morning Challenge, or even most recently we said Get Real, mm -hmm. the Monday Morning Get Challenge. Real. And here's what we meant by that. We have spent the last four to five weeks looking at, you know, the first angel, the second angel, the third angel. We've mm -hmm. been through this quite a bit. And um, sometimes when I teach a, a Bible study at our church, and it's a complicated one, 
I like to wait till the end and I ask people, how does this topic change your life when you go to work Monday morning? That's right. It's Wednesday yeah. evening. I understand That's right. that. Mm -hmm. That's where that title came from. We want to ask four questions that will stimulate our thinking and help us apply what we've learned over the last month and, and make it real. Make it something that is alive and challenges us to grow closer to Christ in these last days. And so I'm going to come back to your involvement. We really, really would love for you to jot down uh, in Facebook comments or even uh, text in a text that you think answers the questions we're going to ask. Yeah. Or if you have a comment, uh, text it in and it'll get passed up to the table and we'll share it. But we want to to stimulate your thinking. That's right. And we want to hear your thoughts as we proceed through the yeah. evening. Yeah, to make it a better study here, because that's what we want to do here. We want to make this relevant. You know, how, how does this apply to my life? It, 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 it yeah. boots on the ground, make it real, yeah. and we can study this. But if it doesn't change me, if it doesn't change my relationship with Christ, if it doesn't change who I am and who I am in His, and, and in his character, we haven't achieved anything. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a, a good way to start out here. You know, the gospel, the everlasting gospel. That's the, the first angel. That's one of the main things that, that starts out the everlasting gospel. Uh, this everlasting gospel, hey, it's got to change us, right? Mm -hmm. It's got to change us. Or, or, or are you going to think, well, what is it? I mean, yeah. what is Christianity? What is it? Is there power? So that's my question, guys, to get kick-started out. And as, I'm, as these guys are giving answers, I want you to be typing in an answer. Please uh, join us. Uh, help us out here. What's the thought that you have? Here's the first question. You know, the everlasting gospel, what does that mean to me? How does that affect my life? Be because, and because, and I'll add to that quick. question, not an answer, but to that question. We throw some of these phrases around so easily, almost yeah. glibly. But again, boots on the ground. What does this really mean in our lives? Yeah. You know, um, when, you, when I hear the word gospel, we just studied this this past week in church for a Bible study. Isaiah starts in chapter 53, mm -hmm. and he says, who will even believe this? Yeah. It yeah. is so good, it's almost unbelievably good yeah. that someone that has never done anything wrong would step in to pay the penalty for everyone's oh, sins. Wow. Yeah. Who would not want to take God up on this deal? Amazing and that's why, that's, why, that's why Isaiah says, who even will believe what I'm going to say now? Yes. Because it's incredibly good. Yes. So what does that trait mean to me? Yeah. That's what we want to uncover tonight. Yeah. So the first thing that it does for me is I recognize that I'm helpless mm -hmm. because... There's nothing I can do to remedy this situation except for accepting the gift mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. Jesus offers to me. It doesn't right. cost me a anything. A free gift. A free gift. doesn't yes. cost me anything. But then how do I respond to that gift? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if somebody stepped in and take a death penalty for a murder that I committed, mm. what will I do for that person's family? Wow. I will do everything. Everything, everything I can everything. to support right. his wife and his children. Yes. And so to me, when I look at the gospel, so often, like Brian said, we throw that word out so easily, yeah, so loosely. just so loosely yeah. that, oh, it's what Jesus did for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But boy, what did he do for what? me? Yeah. I mean, if, if, I, if I take Jesus up on that deal, I will want to live my life for him. Just like I would want to support the guy that stepped in to take the death penalty for me. How I would support his wife and family because he took care of me. I'm going to take care of his family. That's right. Just the same attitude I should have when I accept Jesus' gift. John the Baptist is the prime example of that. He came and he was the center of, a, of, of, of the attention of all of Israel until Jesus showed up. And then he said, I must decrease. decrease. He increase, must increase. increase. Self-sacrifice is the yes. name of the game. Beautiful. So my attitude changes from what I want 
do what he wants right. for me. Yeah. yeah. A beautiful as, Ethian. As you beautiful talked picture. about the free gift, yeah. many of you have, have loaded an app onto your phone. And there's a little line in some of these that says, in-app purchases. And I thought about the idea that many people say, well, yeah, but, but, then, but then you have to do things. You have to, there, there are things you have to do. It's not really free. And it is free because, because there is no trick. There is no bait and switch in this deal. No. What you do is in response to what you get. It is, yeah. it is a response of love. It's not an in-app purchase where you are tricked into getting to additional cost. Didn't explain that well, but yeah, yeah, because I mean, when you when you look at it, Jesus says, "I take the penalty for you. Mm -hmm. In return, you accept a new heart. Yeah. I give you. So there must be a transformation that takes place in my life. Otherwise, I'm not thankful yeah. for what He's done for me. Absolutely, He yeah. does it in me. Yeah. but I must allow Him, invite Him in yeah. to change me, so I can look just like He does. Yeah. Amen. So the, yeah. the gospel, the gospel to me is not only it's, it's the fact that not only did Jesus die for me because because I was hopeless. My life is a dead end street. No hope, no, absolutely no hope beyond this life I'm living. And it's getting worse and worse every day till Jesus comes into my life. And so Jesus not only died to pay the price for our sin, but through his intercessory work right now in the heavens, heavenly sanctuary, he gives me power to live a victorious life here mm -hmm. on this earth. Right. Free, free, yeah. set free from the, the life that I used to live. So one thing that's sometimes overlooked in this deal is I have to give all in order to get what he offers. Mm -hmm. I can't hang on to anything that separates me from him. I have to give it all up. Yes. So there's there's a big surrender. While I was studying, this this little song came up to me. One of the hymns in the old hymnal. Are you going to sing? No, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> but but you know, sometimes with the newer songs, we forget the old ones. It's called "Nothing Between My yeah. Soul and the Savior." Yeah. When we come to Jesus and we make a full surrender, we should look at our life and say, "Lord, ask Him, Lord." What is in my life yeah. that prevents you and me from having a 100% connection? Love relationship. That yeah. must go. Yes. And he will help remove that. If I can't willing. get rid of if it. If you're willing. I have to give it to him. That's right. I have to give it to him. Yes. He does not take anything from me. Yeah. He, I and, must willingly surrender. And that fact and yeah. that point is going to lay over second, third, even fourth questions tonight. Mm -hmm. The idea of my love relationship with Christ and my appreciation for what he's done is so deep that I, I know I have to empty myself of self. Uh, the verse that came to mind as, as I thought about this question is 2 Corinthians 5.17. Again, um, a very familiar verse. I'm going to read it, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Amen. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, which who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And I can't do this on my own, as Etienne said. Mm -hmm. It is only with Christ in me. Yeah. It is only by my invitation and my allowing him in mm -hmm. that I am recreated, yes. um, that I'm made into Christ's image. So this idea of the gospel is not just something that I sit down and I hear at church and it sounds good and I read John 3.16 occasionally. Mm -hmm. It is a 100% transformative concept yeah. in my life. Absolutely. And also at the very end there, it talks about the fact that this gospel and what Christ did for me is the only way I can be reconciled with God right. mm -hmm. for the mess that I'm in, the mess that our world is in. Yes. Without the gospel and the power that it contains, there is no reconnection with my, my creator God. Yeah. yeah. The, the power of the gospel is, is that it's a forever living gospel. Uh, Jesus lives to help us. That's right. He, he lives to help us. He forever, the Bible says, Hebrews 7, 25, he forever lives to help us. Psalms 121 says, I will lift up my eyes into the hills which come with my help. My help cometh from the Lord. 
It's an ever-present need. It's an ever-present Savior in a time of need. He's always there. All we've got to do is let him come in, and that's what you were saying. Yeah. Now, I want to share a couple of scriptures here that, that have touched my life and that I have found that speak to my heart here in, uh, in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power. That, that word power is the word dynamite. He, he's, he's the dynamite uh, of, of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Another scripture is 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolish, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. God. The gospel, the good news, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There, you know, we, we, I think it was you at the end said, we say that word so loosely and take it so lightly, the word gospel. You know, we, even John three sixteen. But to think that God loved you, friends, so much that he was willing to die for you. Not only is he our creator, but he is our redeemer. And so the gospel is powerful and it's life changing. I know. Tim Tidwell sent something in. He sent a short quote from a little devotional book called Steps to Christ. And Etienne, you talked about the idea that I have to give everything up. I have to give all in order for this um, interaction to take place, Sorry. transaction. Here's what this little quote says. But what do we give up when we give all? A sin-polluted heart for Jesus to purify, to cleanse by his own blood, and to save by his matchless love, and yet men think it hard to give up all. Yeah. I am ashamed to hear it spoken of, ashamed to write it. In yeah. essence, I have nothing worth hanging on to. That's right. I'm, I'm filthy rags. Yeah. And if I give up all, the, the favor is all mine. Yeah. Then I get a robe of righteousness in exchange. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in me worth hanging on to. Yeah, Paul figured that one out too, am I right? Philippians 2, 8 says, yeah. he said, I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb. That's right. That's right. It's, that's not worth that, yeah, that's missing the, out on eternity, you know, am I right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. That, you know, and that's my testimony. That I might win Christ, you know? And that's the point that these three angels' messages, I think the, the, the overarching... Uh, point that God is trying to get across. He's saying, get real. And it's time to stop playing games. Yeah. We cannot be half an in and half oh, out. Yeah. Can't sit on the fence. That's, right. that's Laodicea's problem. We're half baked. Nobody likes a half baked pie. Mm. You know, mm. tastes bad. No. You know, and that's that. And that is the 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 witness that we're giving to the world yeah. around us. Mm -hmm. uh, First Corinthians ten thirty one was one of the verses that popped in my mind where Paul says, whatever I do, whether I eat or drink, I must do all Absolutely. to glorify God. I am his representative. You know, you're in the United States. We don't have too many schools that have uniforms. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, where I come from, everybody, everybody wears uniform. Okay, yeah. And boy, when you have uniform on, you don't act out outside of school. Because you'll get in deep trouble. You represent your school. <laughs> right. When you wear those colors, you represent the school. Yeah. And when we claim to be Christians, we wear the uniform of heaven. Yeah. We represent the King of Kings. Yeah. Ambassador. And often we forget yeah. that. So if we in the back of our mind can remember that whatever we do, we should represent Jesus yeah. first, yeah. not ourselves. Yeah. It'll help us to... Get rid of some of Satan's the temptations that he makes us trip on yeah. so yeah. easily. Yeah. Jim yeah. Marino sent a, just a short little statement. He said, if you're brave enough to say goodbye, meaning goodbye to, to myself. To so if, if you're brave enough to say goodbye, Jesus will reward you with a new hello. Goodbye to your old life. And just, you know, his, his, Amen, word, his word saying. Amen. Um, and it, and for some time, sometimes it takes. It takes courage. It takes the strength that God gives us to say yeah. goodbye. Yeah. And, and to understand that we don't have anything worth hanging on to in exchange for that, what we're about to get. That's the hardest thing to do. 
because well, our carnal nature. Yeah, you got, you got. It's kind of like, do I let go or do I want this? Friends, let go and let Jesus. <laughs> let Amen. Amen. Well, and yeah. I, Amen. I think what what this first angel says is not only the worth of Christ's sacrifice for us and and what He offers, but it also helps me know that some of these questions coming up they all pertain to all of us. Uh, this is the universal plea that God gives to all of us yeah. because there's none of us to bring anything of value to the table here by what, ourselves. What we're saying, friends, is the everlasting gospel has got power to change your life, mm-hmm. to set you free. Uh, one of my heroes in the, in the New Testament is Paul. We've already spoken a lot of him. This is, this is what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. He says, And I, brethren... When I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now here this was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And and, and he had a Damascus Road experience with Jesus. And, and you know what? He considered everything else that he was holding on to dumb, dumb. like right. you had said earlier. For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And in my speech and in my preaching were not with persuasive, persuasive, persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit in power, that your faith should not be in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I want to tell you about the power of the gospel. The power of gospel, people can see a change in someone's life. I know my own life personally. I have not, I have not always been a pastor. I lived on the other side of the fence. And I, I, I lived in the dark side of the world. And God has worked a miracle in my life. The gospel, the good news that Jesus loved you so much that he died for you. And as you, as you meditate on the love that God has for you, and as you invite him in to be your personal Lord and Savior, it will change your life, friends. And it, it, it's definitely, most definitely good news. Yep. So... All right, I think we covered the gospel. Any, any other comments before we move on to the next question? I'm just going to okay. read the first, first verse of that song. And this is what the Three Angels' message is all about. It okay. says, Nothing between my soul and my Savior, not of this world's delusive dream. Mm-hmm. I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There's nothing between. Yeah. The, all the world can offer us is a delusive dream. That's right. Mm-hmm. There's no only hope. one sure hope, and that's Jesus. The only hope we've yeah. got is God Jesus. Is there is no other way. And, and really, Jesus. really, that phrase, nothing between, uh, keep that in mind as we get into second, third, fourth questions. Okay. It's powerful stuff. Uh, number two, Rick. Number two, number here two. we are. Okay, here's another big question that we've got to ask ourselves here. Can, in, in, this, in, in the context of the deceiving power of the enemy, who was able to deceive one third of the angels into following him above following God. That's how deceiving in that context, in the context that he was able to deceive Adam and Eve, our first parents. Let's ask this question right here. Could I be in Babylon right now and not even know it? I'm a Christian. Could I be in Babylon? Hmm. So answer it, because I'm going to put a different spin on this question. An interesting thing, just an observation to make. Pastor brought up Adam and Eve, how Satan got them. Mm-hmm. When you notice Jesus' interaction with Lucifer, there was no debate. There was one line answers. Eve debated. Mm-hmm. He got her. We cannot debate Satan. He Smart. would even have gotten Jesus if Jesus gave him the opportunity to debate him. He is such a master. He will twist things around and wrap you around his finger so mm-hmm. quickly. Yes. Jesus said, it is written. And that oh, was the end of the that's story. Right. That's what? the point I that want to is, make. That's and, the and, end of the story for, for Jesus' conversations with them. That's it. Yeah. No discussion. Yeah. It's written. Yeah. Period. Done. The Bible yeah. says uh, uh, that in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, not to lean on our own understanding, right. but to trust in the Lord and let him direct our path. The only way that we're going to be able to overcome the deceiving power of Satan is when we don't trust ourselves and we lay everything up beside the Word of God and make sure it lines up with the Word of God. Okay, with that introduction then, I'll answer the question first, slightly okay. different. Okay. Let's turn to John, one of the Gospels, John 17. And some of you may recognize that chapter 
as a chapter that is full of Jesus' prayers. Yeah. He prayed for himself. Prayer. He prays for his disciples. And the really neat thing is he prayed for, for us. us. That's right. But we're going to look at John 17, verses 14 to 18. I'll read down through it quick. This is in the section where he's praying for his disciples. And we are eventually going to get to what we talked about, it is written. And I'm going to suggest that um, we are all in Babylon. In fact, we all live in Babylon. Um, there's really no getting away from it to some degree. Here's what it says. As I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. Here's the interesting thing. Jesus is saying, I'm not going to pray that the disciples be taken out of this confusion of Babylon. He's going to say, um, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then here's the really neat thing. Sancti that, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The word of God again. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So can we all be in Babylon? Yes. Yes. We, we all confusion. live in Babylon. It's, it, and it's a, it's a confusing place. And God says here, Jesus prays saying, uh, boy, I've just lost my place. Um, he said, I don't want them to be taken out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And so Jesus' prayer is that we would be kept from the evil one. And how we do that is by finding ourselves in God's word. Finding the truth that we find in his word, the power that we find in his word, and, and that is how we are going to stand strong against, like you said, the devil. We, without that strength from God's oh, word. Yeah. No match. No match. We're no toast. Match. Oh, We're yeah. toast. Oh, yeah. And so, yes, we all do live in Babylon. And here Jesus is saying, I don't want my children necessarily to leave Babylon from the standpoint that they are light, they are salt, they are, um, they are the force that will call people out of confusion. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to ground them, not only in the relationship with me, but that relationship, and I'm going to ground them through my word, the yeah. truth and truth. the strength that the comes truth. through my word. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, yeah I, think, Amen. I think Jesus is scarce because sometimes you forget the book of Revelation, Jesus is really the one speaking, am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one speaking. And, and, yeah, and it's a revelation. Look at him. That's right. Yeah. So um, I think he's very clear that, that we as Christians can find ourselves in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, revelation 18, verse 1 through 5 tells us mm -hmm. he, there's a call, a yeah. clarion call that goes out, that kind of goes hand in hand with the three angels' messages, mm -hmm. where God says, come out of her, my people. Mm -hmm. So in order for them to come out, they must be in there. Mm -hmm. to come out so babylon problem with babylon is how can we be in babylon and be christians that's what we want to tackle tonight it's a pretty deep deep discussion and i think i think too we need to understand that there are different ways of looking at babylon mm -hmm. babylon can just be my physical world that i live in that's right but also being called out of Babylon could be being called out of something that's much more spiritual. That's right. Mm -hmm. Something that is much more, if you want to call it relational. Yeah. And so when Jesus is praying in John 17, he's saying, I want my disciples in the world rubbing shoulders with. What you're reading in Revelation 18 is very different. It's, the it's calling me out of yep. Yeah. The evil that's, that's right. referenced in John 17. That's right. That's right. Okay. So go ahead. Right. You know, I interrupt you. Okay, so um, how can I be a Christian and be in Babylon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's several ways. Um, Babylon peddles self made, half baked, lukewarm religion. Yep. Okay? Mm -hmm. Half hearted commitment to God. So I can profess to be a Christian and I can be stuck and immersed in Babylon, even though I think, and I've mentioned this before, I can swear up and down, and I can even convince both of you that I have a relationship with Prince Charles. Mm -hmm. I know his coat size. I know the name of his children. Mm -hmm. I know where he lives. I know how old he is. I know everything about Prince Charles. But the key question is to ask him if he knows me. 
then you know if there's a relationship John that's right. 17, 3. That's yeah, right. That, yeah. so, 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 so often as Christians, we profess to know Jesus. Yes. But does he know me? Yeah. You could be confused. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says there will be people at the end that will come to him and say, Lord, 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 Lord we cast demons out in your name. Yeah. We did all these things. And he's going to say, who are you? Mm -hmm. I don't know who you yeah. are. So we can be self-deceived. Mm -hmm. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, he says, time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. But their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Mm -hmm. So they will run to people that will tell them they're okay. Yeah. Nothing has to change. Jesus did everything for you. You don't even have to give anything up. He's got you covered. Yeah. That's what people want to hear. They don't want to hear the other part. So religious Babylon peddles false doctrines. In verse 8 of the, of the three angels' messages, is very clear that Babylon is very successful. Mm -hmm. and peddling their lies mm -hmm. because the whole world yeah. falls for it. Yeah. And Remember the deceiving power here and, of the enemy. And in the end, if you look at the phrasing, you'll see the reason why people are falling for the deception yeah. is because they're drunk. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, with a sober mind, I can't defend myself against Satan. You didn't Being read it. Drunk, you didn't read all no. Revelation 18, Being, but he's talking about they're drunk, drunk with the wine, basically the, right. false the false teaching. The false yeah. teaching. Have, yeah. have totally gotten them drunk where they yep. can't they don't even know but yep. i mean that's the bad thing about deception am i right yeah if you don't if you know you're being deceived you're not being deceived anymore that's right that's right is you don't even know because if and you're deceived you don't know you're deceived. you don't know that's right so that brings up you know that just if you go back just the the word babylon means confusion if you go yeah. back to the very first time it's brought up in the bible the tower of babel uh it, it's a confusion and we know that's where where they were trying to build a tower and i want to read a scripture in genesis 11 4 it says, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, now we can learn two characteristics of what Babylon is right here. First off, they didn't have faith in God's word. Remember, God had told them that it would, that it would not flood again. It would not flood again. But they didn't have faith in God's word. They didn't they have faith. And they didn't trust him. And so they built this, this huge tower is what they were going to try to do. Another thing that we learn from this scripture is God told them to be fruitful and multiply and scatter out over the whole earth. But if you notice, it says, at least we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. So we see that they were rebellious against God. And then, and then another place in Daniel chapter 3 is the great city, Daniel, the great city of Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 3, we, we see Daniel, uh, in, in, in Daniel chapter 3, we see Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who had erected this huge 90 foot uh, golden image of himself. And he was, com he was, he was compelling or even commanding people to bow down and worship him. So we see a counterfeit form of worship here. So Babylon is a mixture of all these things that we've talked about here. And the only way that we can know we have truth is when we compare it with the word of God. God. Which is why he, he pointed his disciples back to scripture to strengthen them against the evils. And I think too, we have to realize that deception is not one size fits all. No. Depending upon who you are, your background, maybe your faith, maybe your belief structure, whatever it may be, the devil has a deception custom fit oh. for you. And um, I, I love, again, Jim just uh, chimed in here. It says, Babylon is a do-it-yourself religion. It's not what you do, it's who you know. So what you do is a result of who you know. It going back then, yeah. he's, pulling Amen, from, he's pulling from the power of the gospel, the transformative power of the gospel, which then helps us in determining the deception that are being thrown at us, yeah. yes, think, big or yeah, small. I think one of the issues that we face today too is that that we throw phrases loosely around, like um, "all I got to do is follow Jesus," but we don't allow Jesus to qualify what that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I decide what that looks like. I decide. I basically go to the the Bible buffet and I pick out what I like. Would taste the, good. the stuff I don't like, I don't look at. Yeah, which is dangerous. You know, which is yeah. dangerous. And I think that's yeah. part of Babylon's deception is, yeah. is where Satan will say, you know what? That's done away with. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Or, or, that, you're, or that's not so bad. Yeah. You're, you're okay yeah. after all. Everybody yeah. else is doing it. God yeah, doesn't exactly. really mean what he says. 
Guys, we, we dug into that pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got to watch our clock here, but uh, we got two more questions. And I hope that you're engaging in this. We want you. We thank you, Jim and, and Tim. Tim. Anybody else got any other thoughts? Please keep, share. Keep it. them coming. We're Here, watching them at the table. Here's a third big question that we've got to look at. Okay, uh, in the context of again of Satan's deceiving power, the way he can deceive so easy. Uh, how does someone who's a Christian, how could they find themselves worshiping the beast or his image? There's only one way. Okay. And that's through deception. <laughs> through deception. Uh-huh. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah, that's right. There is not There's... one Christian that's going to blatantly go out no. and worship the devil. Not no. one of us no. will do that. No. So how would they know the truth? How would they know the truth? The Word of God. You have to stand on God's Word. Yeah. So, um, any any thoughts on this? So, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 popped in my head when I was looking at this. It deals with deception. And it's really talking about the lawless one when it will come, which we, we've covered in studies before. But there's not only one that's lawless. It will be a bunch of people be lawless at the end. Sure. So Sadly. verse 9, verse 9 through 12 says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, mm-hmm. and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we come back to this. We have to be in this. The love the truth. God, Satan is going... And and the God of truth. Satan will use well-meaning religious leaders to lead deception. He says he's deceiving the whole world. World. And, 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 in, in, you know? and in, Reve- in Matthew chapter 24, he said that even the very elect could be deceived. Yeah. Well, right? you know, last week, Tim used a phrase that has not stuck, or had, had not left my head. He talked about the idea that Babylon can be best described as a do-it-yourself religion, a, a reliance on self. And uh, Etienne is, is spot on with his take on it. But here's, a, here's another angle. Look at Luke 12. And uh, this is the parable of the rich fool. And uh, Luke 12, I'm going to read, just quickly read uh, verses 16 to 21. It says, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Start seeing the deception coming in here. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And I I thought about, for so many Christians, one of the things is that idea of self-sufficiency, that idea that not only am I living for self, but I can handle myself. I can do this. I don't need God, or, or I need God only when things really get tough. And the idea of, um, my ability to not only achieve from an earthly standpoint, but to, to take care of issues in my life. When again, the very first thing we talked about is all we have to offer God is, is our filthy rags. And, but the devil is trying today and will try through the time that he comes again to convince me that I've got what it takes. I don't yeah. need God. Yeah. I don't need his truth in my life. Absolutely. I want to look at a different spin on this now. In um, Revelation Remember that this it says how do how do we make do we, sure we're not worshiping the beast uh, in in the image? Yeah, and we've got to remember we've already looked at this and we know and we talked about it at the very beginning. This is the very same beast that was spoken of in Revelation 13 that deceives the whole world, and we've already learned that 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 the, this whole war broke out over worship. He wants worship, so the the Bible is telling us God is telling us here. 
He's warning us that, that, that there's going to be a religious political power that rises up. We know, we talked about this over the past couple of times we met together. It, ro- it ro- rose up out of pagan Rome. God warns us that this is going to be a system or a vehicle that, that, that will come in and will bring false teachings, things that, like we've been talking about that don't line up with the Word of God. That's the reason it's so important to make sure everything lines up with the Word of God. And he's going to bring false teachings into the church, right? And that's, that's what we're learning here, uh, that just don't line up. Like, for instance, the day of worship. That's in the first angel message. That's, one, that's the reason, the very first angel message that God tells us, hey, wait a minute, this is a warning. You need to come back and you need to worship the creator, not the counterfeiter. Because remember, he is a counterfeiter. He's got a counterfeit form of worship that, that, that he's introducing. And people are, are just being deceived. They're thinking they're worshiping God. But God says, no, no, be, beware of this. And, you know, God makes it very clear on this. Now, listen to this right here in Exodus chapter 31 and in verse uh, 31, 13. This is what God says in his word. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between you, between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord God who sanctifies you. See, friends, when we keep the Sabbath, God's day of worship, we rest in the completed work of Jesus Christ, both as our creator, but also as our redeemer. So God is just saying, well, you just need to be careful here. There's a deceiver out there that's this deceiving people into worshiping his way and on his day. I think it's important too because, you know, for me as a Seventh-day Adventist, so much of my reading is in the Old Testament about the Sabbath. Yeah. But I love going to Hebrews 4, verse 8, and it said right there, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And it goes yes. on from there. Um, for he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works and as God did from his. We're looking at something that God instituted and it's throughout the generations. In fact, it will continue on through eternity. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it is the basis of his relationship with us. It is through his Sabbath that he calls us weekly into a relationship with him. I read my dad got me on a, a couple um, um, Bible scholars that did a commentary on on the book of uh, Genesis. And their comments, and these are non-Adventist, these are theologians, German theologians, their work was uh, translated. But they have a beautiful section on the Sabbath, and it's it's incredible to see what they say. They, They say in their comments that the Sabbath, when God instituted the Sabbath, he looked forward and knew that sin was going to cause the havoc it has. Not only between human relationships, but breaking breaking the bond between man and God. So he instituted the Sabbath looking forward, and the Sabbath served as a promise that the rest that man had before sin came in, Mm -hmm. that he would one day restore that again at the end. So the Sabbath was instituted there in Genesis as God's promise that one day we will not have to sweat to eat anymore. We can be like Adam and Eve was. They ate, but they didn't have to sweat. We don't have to work for our food anymore. God's going to provide everything. So he he provides that rest and the Sabbath. We can use the Sabbath to look forward to that promised rest that we will Amen. once again have when he restores the Amen, Etienne. Yeah. And, and that's yeah. part and of the three angel message right. there too, right. and the third angel, is that, the, it, that those who worship the beast have no rest day nor night right. who worship the beast in his right. image. Guys, we need to move on if we can to the last one, because this, so this is where it really gets good at here. One. You know, this, this is going to be, this is going to be the fun one. You know, what will my life... Before you ask yeah. that question, we're about 15 minutes out from being done. So if you have prayer requests... Now's a great time to either text them in or put them on the bottom of your Facebook Live comment section. So uh, we'd love to pray for what's heavy on your heart or your praises. So keep that in mind as we ask this last question. Okay, this is Biggie here. What will my life look like if I respond to God's final plea positively? 
In other words, how, this is all about how does this affect my life on Monday morning? What's yeah. this got to do with me? What kind of impact will it have on, on my life if I receive the gospel into my life and make a decision to follow Jesus all the way, relying completely on his word? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Gos- okay. uh, Galatians 2.20. The text that popped into my head last night, um, the three of us wrestled with the questions and, and how to kind of uh, summarize everything. And this text came to mind. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave yes. himself yes. for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if, uh, for if righteousness come through the law, then Christ died in vain. For me, what happens when I respond positively to God's plea, mm-hmm. his call in my heart, I, I'm swallowed up in Christ. Yeah. I'm completely yes. absorbed into, into his character. His character um, is mine. His ways are mine. His desires are mine. And I'm sustained and guided by faith. And, and I've accepted Christ's righteousness, his righteous covering over my life. Mm-hmm. I've given, like Tim said, the only thing I had to give is filthy rags. Yeah. I don't know why I hang on to that. But what he offers in exchange... So much better. It, it's some, Dillard's doesn't have anything like no. what we're being offered. <laughs> <laughs> Saks Fifth Avenue, whatever. Yeah. Amen. And, and so what does my life look like? I am an image of Christ. Yeah. I, I reflect who Christ is. Yeah. And and not only in my character, but also in my actions and my words. Yeah. It's, it's a I want to share a change. scripture that would agree with exactly what you said. It's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. Give me five. That's, yeah. my, that's, that's you, my verse. You, you go ahead and say it. <laughs> you, uh, okay, you go ahead and say it. Go ahead. You, you, read, you, go, it, you, you read it in the New Living. Yeah, because I'm going to read it in a different translation. Yeah. I, read it in the New Living yeah. translation. So what, all what of us... again. So it's 2 Corinthians okay. 3.18, okay. and I'm u- using the New Living Translation because I really like how this captures it. Yep. So all of us who have, have had that veil removed, now, the veil, notice that, no longer deceived by the enemy, right? Uh, all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, the Spirit of God, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. And that's exactly right. what you were saying, yeah. Brian. So, yeah. sorry about that. At yeah. the end. So, yeah. so, the veil is the veil of sin. But when you go a little bit up into the chapter, you'll see that, that he's talking about the veil Moses wore when he came out of the tent. Yeah. Okay, he came out of the tent after speaking to God, and his face shone like God's face did. And the people said, please, we don't can't look at you. So Moses would wear a veil. So mm-hmm. Paul says, that's what God wants us to look like. Yeah. He wants us to reflect his glory to everybody yes. around yes. us. Without yeah. a veil on. Yeah. Without a veil on. And, and that word um, transform is the word metamorphosis, which we yeah. talked about before. So I thought to Several myself, weeks ago. you know, how beautiful does the picture of the caterpillar mm-hmm. turning into a butterfly demonstrate this? In order for the caterpillar to be transformed, he must wall himself off to the influences of the world around him. Completely isolated from the influences of the world and in that little chrysala he is transformed beautiful and he becomes a butterfly yeah if he's not in that little cocoon or that little chrysala that won't happen yeah he has to walk so that's that's what i believe god is asking us to do he said i want you to be in the world yeah but i want you to wall yourself yeah. off from the babylonian influences yeah. around you yeah focus on me because I'm the only one that can take the ugly caterpillar and turn it and into a butterfly. You, you know, oh. I was thinking of Philip Craig's and Dean's song about the little boy. This is music night. You know, right? I, was, I was just <laughs> thinking. I love it. Because I mean, I love it. people that write these lyrics just just capture thoughts and put it in such beautiful words. It's it's the dad that says, I want to be like you, Jesus, because yeah. my little boy wants to be like me. More and more like right. Jesus. You know? That's, that's, that is the goal of, of God's final plea. He says, please, 
Philippians 1 6 says, I've started something good in you. And I'm going to I continue. will finish it. You can be confident. Give and, me and, a and, chance. Let mm -hmm. me finish that transformation that I, because I want to put you on display to the yeah. world. Yeah. There's nothing more than I want is to say, this is my son. That's right. And you can yeah. tell he's he's got my oh, characteristics. Ex exactly. Which, which is the life's revelation, yeah. friends. I mean, that's what all this is about. Where as we winding down here, that's what all this is about. This is about Jesus wanting to come back and get his children. He's wanting to come back and the life's revelation that will go to the world is going to be a revelation of the character of Christ. That's reason when in Revelation 14, as it gets through the three angel message, the very next thing, it starts talking about the harvest. The harvest, right? Then I looked and behold a white cloud and, and on the white cloud sat one like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice and him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle, sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he that sat on the, the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth and the earth was reaped. Friends, Jesus said in, in uh, I think it was in uh, John chapter 12, verse 23, He says, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He says, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces grain. We know the grain is Jesus. He died on the cross. Jesus died. But through His death, there will be much fruit multiplied. So He's saying here, Because of my death, there will be a harvest of like kind, which is what you were saying here. Jesus is looking down on this earth. The three angel message has gone out and there will be a people that will accept this message and that will come out of Babylon, come out of false teaching, come out of confusion, come out of the world and give their life wholeheartedly relying completely on Jesus to change their life, giving up on their self to do it, letting go what's in their hand and grabbing hold of Jesus and He's going to reproduce Himself in them. That's a powerful thought. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to and share, then he comes. I'm going to share one more thing. Yes. Uh, Tim, now a little known secret is that uh, usually after we're done uh, with this broadcast, we eat a little something that Bert brings each uh, night. Sorry about and, that, Tim. Um, can, Tim can we Tim get out the and bring it over Tim, here? Tim knows what's on the menu for tonight. So, Tim, uh, we do appreciate your contribution. They are meaningful. But, uh, folks, I, I do believe that Tim is gunning for a piece of apple pie tonight. But... <laughs> In all seriousness, though, Tim wrote something that's true. He says, as the Jews departed from God and failed to make the righteousness first message of Christ their own by faith, the Sabbath lost its significance to them. Truly accepting Jesus into the heart recreates his image in us. We become like Jesus in character. No longer are we like the beast. So what are we going to look like? We're going to look, look like, like Jesus. Jesus. We're yeah. going to look like Jesus, and, and we're going and, to and we're going to want nothing more than to spend eternity with them. And we're going to have a family reunion. What's our clock look like? Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna have a family, a great big family reunion. It's what this is going to be. It's yeah. going to be a family reunion. All those that put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ are going to be there. What a glorious day that's going to be! It's we were created, friends, for one reason. And that's for a relationship with God. We were created for God, by God, for God. He loves us and He cares about us. There's a special place in, in God's heart that can only be filled by you. There's not another you on this earth, on this planet. You were created for eternity. And so God is in Revelation 21. In uh, uh, Revelation 21, let me just capture this beautiful message right here. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God, uh, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away. Listen to this. This is so beautiful. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have been passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and they are faithful. Hmm. And, it, and it, yeah. I look at Titus two thirteen, and it talks about a people that are looking 
for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of a great Lord. That's and, right. And, I, and the story that came to mind, that we, I knew we were going to close. My, my five-year-old granddaughter, um, I guess I spent an entire day thinking that perhaps Jesus was coming back that day. Yeah. And she was getting ready for bed, and she looked at my daughter, her mom, and said, Mommy, she said, I, I, I guess Jesus isn't coming today. Yeah. And, and hmm. Jamie looked at Emily and said, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, she said, it's dark outside. And, you know, we got our jammies on. We're, we're getting ready for bed. So I guess it's not going to be today. Hmm. And, and imagine if our lives were driven with that kind of expectancy, hmm. with that kind of eagerness, yes. with that kind of, of life-changing faith that we said, maybe today. I know it's not necessarily theologically correct in timing and everything, but the faith of a child that that is looking forward to maybe today is the day. Yes, that he yeah. comes back. That's the that's the anticipation, just waiting. Yeah, Jesus is coming again, and he's coming soon, friends. The best is yet to come. Um, I want to close this in prayer. This has been an incredible Bible study. I've got a I've got a prayer request mm -hmm. right here. A very dear friend of ours, Amy. Uh, we need to pray for her health. And we love you, Amy, and we're going to be praying for you. Uh, I know there's others out there. we got friends in Texas that's got some health issues. Uh, we're just so thankful they're wrapped up in Jesus. Um, but I want to pray. My prayer tonight is that the veil be removed. That every one of you out there, every one of us, hmm. all of us, because no one is, no one is, can, is any, any we, we have no strength against the deceiving power of the enemy. So I pray that our that our veil that that the veil be removed, that our eyes will be opened, to, and that the deceiving power of Satan will be will be loosened. Um, so I want to pray about that. And before we do, yeah, I'll, yeah, we'll pray. I'll, I'll yeah. do that. Okay, then. all right. Join me in prayer, Father in heaven. We realize, Lord, that um, that you love us and that you care about us. You've asked us to share this message. It's right in your Bible, and that's the reason we've shared it, Lord. Uh, we know it wasn't an easy message to share, but it's a message that's got to be shared. So we pray for your Holy Spirit to do the work in the hearts of those that you want to watch this and, and impress upon them your truth and that you would lead and guide them to all truth, Lord, and that you would remove the veil from their eye. Uh, Lord, we just we thank you, dear God, uh, that, that, that we have got your word that, that really is uh, a guiding light to us, Lord. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to work in all of our hearts. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. There's a lot of detail that we haven't covered over the last five to six weeks. And uh, we'd like to offer you, if you're interested, a free booklet. It's simply called American Bible Prophecy. And if you'd be interested in getting uh, this sent to yeah. your home, we would uh, be more than happy to do that. Let me give you the phone number. Go ahead and text your name and your mailing address. Uh, to 479-220-7107. That's 479-220-7107. And uh, we'll drop one of these bookings in the mail. It'll give you an opportunity to, at your leisure, to dig a little deeper into this uh, God's final plea topic. Jesus loves you, friends. And the best is yet to come. Jesus really is coming back soon. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.